Hello and welcome to the FMCC webinar, BIM and FM, How Building Information Modeling is Transforming Facility Management in Asia and Around the World. My name is Josh Weymouth, Component Liaison. And next slide, please. I do want to let everyone know that they have been muted for audio quality. If you do have any questions during the webinar, please feel free and type them into the question or chat box. And we'll go over them during the Q&A portion of the webinar. And also, after the webinar, a copy of the PowerPoint will be sent out to everyone that has registered. Next slide. And as always, we do want to let you know that the FMCC has resources available to its members, such as Ask the Expert, Find a Consultant, Locate a Speaker, and Online Educational Resources. At this time, I want to go ahead and turn it over to our moderator, Graham. Graham, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joshua. Well, welcome everybody to today's presentation. We're very lucky to have uh, Michael Schley giving us this talk on um, building information modeling. Um, quite a um, relevant topic these days with the advent of smart buildings and so on. So I'm looking very, very much forward to uh, listening to Michael. Uh, next slide, please, Michael. Um, during the presentation, there will be a couple of polls. If this is an uh, uh, an opportunity for Michael to um, be interactive with everybody and ask a couple of uh, questions relevant to the presentation. So look out for those as we go through. And as Joshua says, uh, Q&A will reserve for the end. Um, and um, please, um, if you have any questions, uh, don't be frightened to ask. Thank you. Next one, please, Michael. Um, at this stage, I'd like to thank very much our sponsors, Platinum Gold and Silver Sponsors. Um, we're very grateful for their support of uh, the FM Consultants Council and, and in particular these, uh, these webinar series this year that we're holding. Next one, please, Michael. Okay, Graham, thank you very much for the uh, introduction and uh, thank you, Joshua. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, speaking with you all this morning uh, to give you a bit about my background. Uh, I started my career as an architect and became um, fascinated by what technology could do with the design of buildings. Uh, this was in the first wave of technology, the CAD days in the early 80s. And uh, many of us had the vision then of technology that would know everything about buildings. But the uh, power of the computers wasn't up to the task yet. Uh, about some years later, um, about 10 years ago, that started changing and we started seeing BIM come in, so today we finally realized the promise of, of what we only could visualize back then. Um, my company is FM Systems. We're in the business of developing what uh, used to be called CAFM, Computer Aided Facility Management. Uh, we prefer the newer title, Integrated Workplace Management Software. Uh, we're also partners with Autodesk for BIM and FM. Uh, we happen to be uh, based in the U.S., but we have customers uh, worldwide. Uh, learning objectives is to get a better understanding of what BIM is, what it can do, uh, and how we need to really master this technology for advantage. Uh, we are at the uh, early stages, early days of a, a journey, uh, and the way we'll get through it is to all learn from each other. I'm going to ta start with a bit of definition. Uh, what is BIM and what is not BIM, then talk about why we care. Uh, what are the benefits for the various participants in the building process? Uh, then go into some of the issues for the facility management profession, issues, challenges, things we've got to uh, develop if this technology is really going to fulfill its promise. From there, talk a bit about the global perspective, particularly in Asia, where things are uh, quite exciting. Uh, and then, uh, depending on time left, a couple of case studies, some real-life examples of organizations using BIM in facility management. So what is BIM? I uh, like to think that there's a short version of that and a long version. Uh, the short version is that it is an authoring system that allows people to define buildings in 3D with object intelligence. So what is object intelligence? Well, it's a sense of um, the model knowing what it's made of, um, having properties on the elements, and having the abilities uh, for relationships between those elements. So a simple example is doors and walls. Rather than just being represented with lines and arcs, 
doors or objects that know how to interact with walls. When you uh, expand the width of a wall, the door frame would automatically adjust. When you slide a, a door down or insert it, the wall adjusts. Uh, and uh, like that, so that the, um, we have a, a smart model that has a sense of itself. Now that's the, um, the short definition. Uh, a longer definition is one I like that was coined initially by Mortensen Construction up in the Minneapolis area of the United States. And uh, by the way, I'll give a plug for this book, the BIM Handbook, which is the best general BIM book I'm aware of. Um, edited by Chuck Eastman and Paul Teicholz and uh, available wherever you buy your books. So I'd recommend it to you. Uh, Mortensen's definition is first that it's digital, so scan drawings don't cut it. It has to be vector-based uh, digital representation and it has to be 3D. That's fairly obvious. Uh, it has to be measurable, meaning it can be quantified, dimensioned, and I'm not sure if this is truly a word, but we'll assume it is queryable. You can ask it a question, it will give you an answer. And I think uh, those attributes are firmly in hand. Uh, BIM systems today clearly do that. The next three are works in progress, so uh, it has to be comprehensive uh, throughout the phases and life of a building. Um, and including aspects of it, including financial means and method. We're getting there, but we've got some distance still to travel before BIM systems truly represent all aspects of a building. Uh, accessible uh, to uh, the entire AEC owner team. Um, by the way, i uh, always a bit amused by the um, bias or myopia of uh, people in the design and construction business that they look at everybody after the end of the building construction process as an owner. And in fact, uh, most of us know that the actual owner of the building is perhaps the least interesting party. The occupier is a lot more interesting and the op operator is more interesting. So uh, I've been lobbying that we should see, instead of seeing saying AECO, we ought to say AECOOO, owner op occupant operator. Um, but anyway, accessible to everybody uh, involved in the process. And finally, and this last one is my favorite, durable. I think there's tremendous value in having a BIM model that travels and stays with the building throughout its life. Uh, too often, the BIM model is used just for construction and then it's lost, and that's a great shame. I don't think it has to be that way. And I think both definitions of BIM are applicable. Focused BIM on the authoring, bigger BIM on all of the systems needed to accomplish those things. It's also useful to talk about what is not BIM. And these, in my view, are related information systems. They have a valuable interchange of information. But it's best, in my opinion, to distinguish them from the BIM tools. So starting up on the uh, top left, Building automation systems uh, and the new hot aspect of that IoT or Internet of Things. Uh, this is a, a, a booming area, a lot of interesting things happening with it. Uh, the foundation of it has been around for quite a few years, so building automation goes back at least 30 years. But um, new technology with sensors connecting everything to the Internet is, is brand new stuff. Um, People from the outside would logically confuse that with BIM, but in fact there are different players, different developers, different vendors providing those tools and different problems being solved. Uh, clearly uh, an exchange of information is valuable, so BIM defining the building, building automation systems defining the actual building in, um, in real life operation. Down on the bottom left we have GIS or geographic information systems and uh, a lot of similarity uh, to what BIM is. They model real life. They model physical reality. Um, but they're worried about different things. They worry about topography. They worry about access, traffic, etc. cetera. Um, BIM is up worried about how buildings are constructed and what that physical reality is. So although there's overlap and you, there are aspects in BIM that can be used for GIS and GIS to a small extent can be used to model buildings, we find that, again, different vendors, different aspects, um, different developers, and uh, the cleanest use is to use BIM for buildings and stop roughly at the 
the footprint of the building and have GIS pick up from there. The top right, CMMS, Computerized Maintenance Management Systems. The systems that we use for managing our uh, building operations and maintenance, both work request and preventive maintenance, uh, and they're very good at what they do. Uh, and they have to work in a real-time basis to uh, route work orders, assign work, analyze tasks, etc. They are a very big consumer of BIM information, and that's important. But BIM information, BIM systems don't make very good maintenance systems, and vice versa. And then finally, on the bottom right, uh, the field that my company is in, IWMS, uh, also known as CAFM. Um, they take, BIM, again, a big consumer of BIM information, but we add other information. We add organization, occupancy, leases, real estate, uh, sustainability, all sorts of other things. So um, the best relationship is to understand the distinctiveness of each of these and then to work on the interfaces so that relevant information can be shared and exchanged. So why do we care? Why does anybody care about this, this technology? We'll start toward the beginning of the uh, design process with the architects and engineers. And it was interesting to me uh, about 10 years ago when BIM started becoming practical um, and accessible and available that um, architects and engineers started using it, particularly architects. Uh, at first they uh, had hoped that their clients would pay extra for it, uh, but that didn't quite work out any more than it worked out for uh, paying extra for CAD back in the old days. Uh, but despite that, we found uh, large firm after large firm and large project after large project deciding to use BIM. So why was that? Well, it really was a better, BIM is a better framework for information. For what architects and engineers do, BIM works better than CAD did. Uh, things like sustainability initiatives are much more readily available using BIM. Analysis. Um, great visualization, a lot more than you could have, could do with CAD, and uh, in summary, just a better way to draw. So that battle was won about seven or eight years ago, and McGraw-Hill runs surveys on this, and you can see from 2007 to 2012, a flipping of about a quarter of the firms using BIM heavily to about three quarters, and that's with a worldwide recession in the middle that slowed people down. Now the interesting part of this story is general contractors, because we have this bias about contractors that the, they're the, the least technically, technically savvy player in the whole business. Uh, in fact, that's very much not true, and in fact BIM offers them some particular advantages. Uh, they're in the business of coordinating construction and coordinating different contractors and work groups, and if that's your problem, then BIM gives you some great benefits. Uh, first of all, it allows you, it's a great planning tool for planning things in time and space. Uh, one of the, the great benefits and uh, value propositions is clash detection. So if there's an error that's going to happen, much cheaper to detect it early and solve it um, on the BIM model or the drawing board, so to speak, rather than out in the field where it's incredibly expensive to change things. Um, easier to adapt to discovered problems. Uh, and then um, interesting work underway, still a long ways to go, but we're at the early stages of using the design model as a base for fabricated components. Uh, I've seen interesting uh, case studies with automatic rebar cutting. Uh, tremendous savings uh, and avoidance of wasted rebar, for example. And then finally synchronizing procurement so that the right trades arrive at, arrive at the right times. So contractors have taken to this, particularly the major contractors who have the wherewithal to, to field a technology team. So where does that leave us as facility managers? The uh, biggest and most obvious benefit is integration with maintenance management. Um, we need what that BIM information model knows, because within that BIM model uh, is information about most of the major equipment and most of the major systems, how they're connected, how they relate, uh, and the details about both generically and specifically what the equipment is. And getting a um, direct exchange or sharing of information between the BIM model and the facility management system can cut 
a lot of time off out of that initial setup that's usually needed to set up that system. So a fast handoff to uh, go immediately into operation. I think extending this idea, my dream is that where we end up is what I would call an electronic owner's manual. Uh, today the knowledge of a building is captured in three ring binders or possibly on CD-ROMs and PDF files, um, not much more accessible than th the 3D binders. If we move that into a live information system, we've got something much more valuable. And I think that's where we're heading pretty quickly. Building performance analysis. The BIM model is a great launching pad for doing what-if studies and looking at different ways that choices that we might make in retrofit or design choices might reduce our energy footprint and might reduce our resource footprint. A third benefit is keeping up with change. We like to think that once the building is built, that's it. But I think as we all know, that's not it. Within a year or two or three, there will probably be some construction project happening. And if we run it out five or 10 years, there are going to be some major changes made in that building. We don't have a very good track record of keeping up with those changes. And you hear story after story of people really not knowing what happened when, what's up in those ceilings, what's, hap what's in the plenum spaces. And BIM can, uh, can improve the situation if we treat the BIM model as our system of record and have the discipline to keep up with it, we can re reduce the guesswork, reduce the uncertainty that contractors, renovation contractors have when they come in and do projects, um, and do a better job of keeping up with the ongoing changes that we know are going to happen over the 30, 40, or 50 years of that building's life. And finally, um, better life cycle management. Uh, we know that most of the cost of buildings occur after they're built, uh, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent. Uh, so using the BIM model as the information system throughout the life that looks at not only the building as it um, as we take occupancy of it, but where we're going with it, what improvements are going to be needed to keep it in good working order for many years to come. So those are some of the benefits that are there, uh, and people are starting to realize. It is, as I say, early days still, but uh, we do work with people who are doing some of these things. So there, like many things that are new, there are issues and there are challenges. Uh, what does this mean to uh, the folks we work with? Well, first of all, um, good to uh, do a bit of a sampling of how much BIM is being used by facility managers. So McGraw-Hill uh, publishes these reports called the Smart Market Reports. You can Google that, and uh, they're free to download. And they did one two years ago on the uh, business value of BIM for owners. Uh, and again, this reflects, I think, their bit of bias that the only people who count in the process are owners, but be that as it may. Um, this is the good news, the bad news, and the good news. So the bad news is that um, as of two years ago, only 68 percent, sorry, only 14 percent of owners were using BIM for high capability, and another 18 percent for moderate capability. In other words, only about a third of owners were using BIM at all. The good news is that most of those people surveyed saw that inverting in about five years so that by 2019, um, the um, use of BIM in either high or moderate would be about 75 percent, and the low would be down to 25 or 26 percent. So that tells us that the belief is there. A lot, most people see that this is where we are heading. Um, it would just be nice if we, we moved a little faster than we are, but uh, it's, a, it's a journey. Some of the issues have to do with technology, but I will tell you that the technology is pretty much there. So one of the capabilities is to exchange information between the BIM model and the facility management system. Uh, there are several ways to do this. One is through a file transfer, and, and that is um, possible with most systems. 
I don't think that's where we want to end up though. So um, my philosophy has always been not to do a file transfer but to do a bi-directional data exchange and data sharing. So that when we're um, doing things in BIM, it's aware of the rest of the uh, FM system. And when we're doing things in our um, facility management system, um, we can access BIM information. So this is a uh, image that you're seeing is a proof of concept we did with Autodesk. Uh, on the outside is our uh, IWMS system. And then the window with the 3D drawing um, is a uh, interoperable um, window with Autodesk 3D Viewer. Uh, so the way this works is you can click on a uh, on an object here, a piece of equipment, and down at the bottom window it will show you information. Uh, conversely, you can find a piece of equipment and it will highlight it in the 3D window. Now I will admit uh, 3D is often a bit of eye candy. Um, but it does have its value. Uh, you can see things, particularly the way um, this Autodesk Viewer has been implemented with the nice gray out features that, uh, that provide information and value about what's happening in a building. So it uh, would be foolish not to use it because it is there available. So again, an issue is the integration and uh, that's pretty well in hand with a lot of the major systems. If, you're, if you keep up with technology, I'm sure you hear about cloud-based systems. And uh, the cloud has a very important role when it comes to BIM. And that role is because a lot of the expertise we need is not sitting in our offices. It's sitting with specialized consultants. Uh, or maybe as one of the people on this call, you are one of the specialized consultants. Um, the great thing is, from a facility manager's point of view, they don't need to have that expertise in their building. By using cloud-based systems, uh, the data can be shared uh, through the cloud so that uh, all the participants can, uh, can have access to it. In addition to cloud computing, the other, one of the other big technology trends is mobile devices. Um, and also on this slide, I've got web browser, which isn't such a hot trend, but it's certainly the way we all consume information. So good strides are being made here also with BIM information being uh, accessed through a web browser uh, and mobile device as well. Um, the slides down at the bottom are um, the uh, BIM 360 field product that Autodesk makes that lets contractors go out in the field and get information for markup. Now, one of the big challenges that I think the consulting community is going to play a big role in is the BIM deliverable. The problem is um, we have a cornucopia of too much choice. We are like at the big cafeteria and we have a, a thousand different foods we can eat and they're all good, but if we eat all of them, we're going to be ill. Uh, BIM is like that. BIM really knows too much. And the challenge is to figure out what information we really need and how do we ask for it. Uh, issuing a broad statement that the uh, contractor shall deliver a BIM model is asking for a fairly useless set of information. Uh, so what's really needed is to specify the particular um, information, um, systems and equipment items that we need and the properties that we care about uh, in that. And I would uh, advise from my experience that less is more. That starting simple, starting lean, uh, walking before you run is the key to success. We've seen too many people try for too much. And the catch is uh, it's not that much work to, to hand it over, to deliver it. But if you moved a year down the road, what people will find is that they have not been able to keep that information up to date. And the result of that is a set of information that is some, mostly right, but not completely right. The trouble is nobody can tell you which part is right and which part is out of date. And that causes distrust on the information set uh, and ultimately causes it to fail because if you can't trust it, it's worse having, um, it's better to have no information than untrustworthy information. If you have no information, you know that, and you know you're going to have to go out and survey. If you have untrustworthy information, you're liable to guess, and uh, that's a very bad place to be in. So 
One of the best answers at the moment out there is the COBE standard. Uh, COBE stands for Construction Operations Building Equipment Information Exchange. Uh, it is sponsored by the, um, um, let's see, I'm, the Building Smart Alliance, and I don't have that reference here. Uh, if you download the, um, the PDF of the PowerPoint, you can get this uh, web link here. This is where you can download it. And the first version of COBE was fairly generic and, in my view, not that useful. But the COBE 2 standard, and I believe COBE 2 has been in draft form for quite a while now. It's, uh, I'm not sure if it's been validated or, or not. I think it's still in the process of being confirmed. But it's a pretty decent set of, of standards. Uh, so they go through each of the major equipment items um, and types and they recommend a set of properties that you would want to know about those uh, types of equipment. Uh, I think it is worth um, reviewing and refining. I think any one of us might choose to do it a little bit different, differently, but it's a pretty good starting place um, and you could, uh, you could do a lot worse than use that as a basis for a BIM deliverable standard. It's also been referenced by uh, a lot of people around the world. In a few minutes, we'll talk about the UK effort. And if you dig deep enough, you'll see that they reference back to the, the COBE standard. Now, where do you begin? What are the prime candidates for BIM? Um, I would suggest first, owners who occupy. And that would be government and education are the typical ones. And some corporate owners who own their own buildings. Uh, because logically they have the long-term interest in putting some effort up front during the design and construction process and to get the payback down the road. In our typical office construction and corporate commercial lease um, situation, our parties are separated and the value doesn't necessarily flow from the contractor to the developer to the investor who owns it to the occupier to the uh, company that has the long-term lease or the short-term lease. But on the other hand, education and government um, do have an alignment of interest. Secondly, technical buildings. And I would put in this category uh, buildings with a lot of plumbing, so to speak. So laboratories, uh, healthcare, and airports all make very good value propositions for BIM. There's a lot going on in those buildings. They're very expensive buildings. It's uh, very problematic if you don't uh, have a good set of information because when it comes time to remodel, uh, you can't afford to make a mistake if you're remodeling a hospital. So um, the payback is, is very large in those and they make very obvious candidates for BIM. Uh, and then finally new buildings because uh, probably there's a BIM model being done already and we have the choice of taking the BIM model or having it dumbed down to CAD drawings. So um, wherever we can make use of the BIM model, obviously that's a, a clear win as long as we make good use of it. So uh, what about older buildings? Are they uh, out of luck or not? And they're not necessarily out of luck. We actually have some of our clients um, paying to have BIM models made for their entire portfolio, uh, some of which, some buildings which were built 10, 20, 30 years ago. Now they're doing it with what I would call lightweight BIM. Uh, so they're not trying to do everything. Uh, they're doing walls, doors, uh, workstation footprints, the main mechanical systems. Uh, so that would be the uh, HVAC system and probably the electrical systems, probably not the plumbing. Um, and it's critical if you're going to do that that you think through how you're going to keep it up to date. Uh, it's not worth having information if you don't keep it accurate. So that whole work process needs to be thought out and uh, dedicated to. There's also some um, value in special purpose BIM. BIM that might be a one-off and might not be kept up, but it's used for special analysis. Uh, and then one of the interesting technologies is point clouds. Uh, they set up a couple of laser guns that spin around, triangulate, uh, and paint, so to speak, a, a series of dots which are um, geometrically correct and uh, provide a, a um, using image recognition software, uh, have a reasonable success in creating a BIM model out of a basically a, a real life CAT scan, if you will. I don't think, um, I'm still a bit of a purist on myself on this and I 
somewhat prefer measured drawings or measured BIM models, but uh, it's got value, and particularly it has value for mechanical rooms that you can't exactly measure easily, but you need a good representation of. So our first poll, um, assuming that everybody, for those of you on the call who are consultants, or any of your clients requiring BIM deliverables, or if you are a facility manager, are you requiring a BIM deliverable? Answer yes, if that is true, please. And Josh, I think you're going to launch our poll. And uh, Josh Amos, do we have the poll? And I can't see a poll, but um, I'm hoping other people it's can. It's 50-50. Okay, 50-50, not bad. Okay, a bit of a trick question, uh, because poll number two is, are you actually using that information for FM and operations? Let's see how this, these questions go, now that you've asked for it. Oh, I see it up in the monitor screen. Oh, 100%. Is that, uh, is that true, Josh? Um, it came up 50-50 again. 50-50 again, okay. Well, that's maybe reassuring that those who are asking for it are using it and uh, the rest are considering it, I'm sure. That's why we're all together on this webinar today. So moving now into uh, global aspects, um, BIM is very much a global aspect. There are a few parts of the world that are not um, using BIM to, to some extent. Um, the, um, again, citing a McGraw, one of the McGraw-Hill studies, uh, this is a measure of um, contractors, so it's a bit of a skew there, uh, and it's how long the contractors have been using BIM uh, by region and country. Um, so we see North America uh, claims to have the, uh, the longest experience, followed by Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, then UK, uh, Western Europe, and Brazil. Um, I, um, I more or less believe this for contractors, but I've got a different perception on designers because in my um, knowledge, uh, Australia actually leads the world in front of the U.S. and Canada in BIM for design. We've seen a lot of advanced things come out uh, in greater preponderance from Australia than the, than the U.S. Um, but it's an interesting point of reference, and just because some of these people are a little bit um, late to the party doesn't mean that they're not racing ahead. It does tell us that a lot of people are using it everywhere. Now, there's another aspect, of, which is where governments are mandating it. And uh, this also from McGraw-Hill shows a dot anywhere there's, where there's a, a government presence. I had the chance to speak at the uh, Singapore Government BIM Conference a couple of years ago, and there were representatives from about everywhere, uh, particularly the uh, Asia region um, and countries uh, including um, Vietnam, I think Philippines, Malaysia, uh, New Zealand, uh, Australia, of course, Japan, South Korea, China, um, just about every country that was building things had a government influence uh, in the standard. So this is the other thing that is driving BIM adoption worldwide is uh, government directives. Um, the biggest splash among big government directives is the UK initiative. Uh, so the UK BIM task group um, made the bold move several years ago that they would require BIM for all public sector buildings starting this year in 2016. Um, and they're doing that. Uh, it's a very large effort, really mobilizing the whole design and construction um, professions and fields to uh, get with BIM. Uh, they uh, referenced back to the Building Smart Alliance and the COBE standards as what was being delivered. And they described this as level two. Uh, now, the, the terms get a little bit thick, and if you read this stuff, it's fairly heavy reading. But what you eventually discover are, are they're using this as an indication of maturity. Uh, there's a similar term, which is level of development, and it is different than 
LOD or level of development. Um, some commonality, some overlap, but is a, a tad different in intent. So that is well underway, and it's really a supercharged BIM adoption in the UK. Um, just a couple of months ago, they uh, released their strategic plan for the next step, which they call Level 3 BIM. And the difference between Level 2 and Level 3 is that Level 2 is a requirement of the geometry and the properties of BIM. Level 3 uh, moves beyond that to require interoperability uh, and shared information uh, with a much broader ecosystem of systems. Um, the document is uh, free to download, um, fairly conceptual, so they're not putting too many stakes on the ground on precisely what they mean, but they have put a stake in the ground that that's where they're heading next. So uh, that is a, uh, a group worth watching. I've put their uh, URL on the slide here, uh, bimtaskgroup.org. But moving back to the other side of the world, um, I find Asia particularly fascinating because most of the new construction in the world is being built in Asia. Uh, this set of data is, comes from uh, IHS, um, probably the most respected source for economic data worldwide. Uh, not real fresh, it goes back to two uh, 2013, uh, but we find to nobody's surprise that China is building more than anybody by a factor of two. Uh, U.S. follows. Uh, Japan was somewhat interesting, but uh, there's a little bit of an anomaly here because this uh, reflects the uh, recovery from the earthquake. So I think if you pulled that this year, you would find Japan a few uh, notches down on the list. Nevertheless, Japan is building a lot of things, and their BIM maturity is, is quite uh, far along. Uh, India after that, just because it's so large, I think, uh, followed by Western Europe and then Brazil. So. Um, but we can see a lot of construction, a lot of new construction and big construction happening in Asia. And because that's happening with advanced construction companies and advanced architects and engineers, there's a lot of BIM at work in those places. And uh, my uh, final uh, plug from McGraw Hill, um, about a year ago they published this report, a Business Value of BIM in China. Now let me call your attention to the graph here. Um, this is architects, and uh, the first uh, bar is 2014, the second is 2016, and we see that um, the uh, green and the brown and the uh, tan are high, uh, very high, high and moderate use of BIM. And you can see, let's focus on the high, going from 14% to 26% in just two years, basically a doubling in two years. So what is notable about these, uh, these statistics is the rate of increase um, and how quickly the uh, AEC community has adapted and embraced BIM as a way of doing business. I think probably faster than we've seen any technology happening in AEC um, in my lifetime in the world. So um, in my work in China, I find them uh, very eager to embrace new technology. Um, a, a very gutsy about it, uh, not at all reticent, uh, and willing to try the latest thing, and eager to try the latest thing. So uh, I think we're seeing some new things blazed by by China. Now, obviously, they're a little bit slower this year than they were a year ago, but nevertheless, um, there's a whole lot of change happening in China, as we all know. So it's one of the places to watch. Let me uh, call your attention, though, to a place somewhat smaller than China, but in my view, the world's leader in BIM. Um, Singapore is the test lab for the rest of us, and we can watch them try some things, and we can learn from that. So six years ago, Singapore in, um, implemented and um, decided uh, on the BCA BIM roadmap. BCA stands for Building Construction Authority. It is Singapore's building um, department, and it is their general services administration. They both oversee the uh, construction of all government buildings, and they um, inspect and certify all private sector buildings. Um, people from Singapore tell you that they've got a nice advantage, and they do because um, they um, have a, a single level of government, so uh, they don't have those conflicts. Most of us and uh, other countries have between federal and local and state 
uh, entities that don't always get along. Uh, so things can move a little bit quicker um, in Singapore than they do in uh, most of the rest of the world. So this, the BCA BIM roadmap, uh, the goal was that by 2015, last year, 80% of construction would be using BIM and that over the decade between 2010 and 2020, they would save 25% on construction cost. Um, the requirement was that as of last year, 2015, all buildings, not just public, but public and private, that were 5,000 square meters or larger, which is not a real big building, that's your basic two-story small building, would require BIM. Now, they not only mandated that, like other uh, some other places have done, but they've actually they also enabled it, and I think that's what's significant about the BCA roadmap. So they realized they had a learning curve, uh, so they uh, tasked the BCA Academy to develop classes, courses, support for university programs, support at the Polytechs um, to teach BIM. Uh, so all sorts of ways that practitioners, students could learn BIM skills. They also provided funding. So um, they had a fund of money that you could get reimbursed for half the cost of BIM software or BIM training. They uh, came up with a compliance method, which is using technology to do that. In order to get a building permit in Singapore, you have to submit a BIM model. And they set up a whole system to enable you to do that. Uh, so they not only uh, required it, uh, enabled it, but they came up with a me method of compliance. And they oversaw the development of standards so that it became clearer and there was less confusion over what a BIM deliverable was. Um, and you can go to, um, uh, on an earlier slide, I have their general website. You can go there and download their uh, version 1 and version 2 of the BIM guide. Now, as of a couple of years ago, what they had not done yet is move into FM. So um, two years ago, we had heard about a pilot project, and we uh, put in a tender for it, and we're lucky enough to win that with our partner in Singapore. And the objective of this pilot project was to uh, create a test bed to uh, integrate BIM with FM, uh, and then also to uh, develop a report that guide development. So let me describe the test bed. Uh, they provided a, a BIM model for a, a, a small community center. We then took that. Uh, connected it uh, to a web server and a database, and then put that in the cloud. So we used Amazon Web Services so that everybody from uh, anywhere, you know, Singapore, the US, where, wherever, could, who had proper security could, uh, could access this. Made that viewable through a web browser for uh, space management and maintenance. Then extended that to mobile, uh, both phones and tablets. And they had one other thing they were really set on. Uh, mobile floor plans were nice and mobile work orders were nice, but they really wanted to see it in 3D on a tablet. And at the time we started the project, that wasn't quite possible. Uh, they kept hammering on us, and uh, about a week before I was due to speak at their main conference, um, Autodesk released a new version of their viewer that started working. Um, and uh, we got their large model viewer on, a, um, on an iPad. Uh, in the cloud. And what's interesting in the technology is I can sit here in the US, access the site, goes all the way over to Singapore where the Amazon Web Services is, bounces back to California where the Autodesk Large Model Viewer it sits in their cloud, and all of it works seamlessly. Stuff we only dreamed about a few years ago. So it was a nice uh, case study of what you could do. I'd say the more significant part of the project is this little line of requirement that we discovered uh, halfway through that we were supposed to write a report and a guide. So we are set to work in doing that, and I'll, I'll share a few of the salient points with, uh, of that guide with you. Um, my co-author of this was uh, Brian Haynes in our office, and as we uh, analyzed the problem, we realized that there really were the BIM model needed to evolve over the phases of the building's life. So it starts with a design model, which is very generic, moves to a construction model, which is specific and very detailed, and collecting all sorts of information. And it was our contention that we wrote about that uh, this should be saved as an as-built model. Now, that's something you stick away in the file. Uh, it's big, it's heavy, it's slow, 
but it contains a lot of information which might be useful down the road. Somebody drives a truck into your entrance wall and you need to figure out who was the supplier on that and what were the specs. That BIM model should have that information. The thing is, though, it's too much information for day-to-day -day use. Uh, it, some of it's going to change and you can't keep um, track of which parts, and it's just too big and slow. So what we recommended is that we it go through one additional evolution to a, um, a BIM FM model that's lightened up, it's got some information added and a lot of information subtracted. Uh, we put this um, for a, a public download and it's at this address, so if you download the slides later you can uh, get the, uh, the download URL and would welcome your, uh, your feedback on it. Um, so um, I have just a couple of minutes for case studies, and then we'll leave a few, about five minutes at least, maybe ten for questions. Um, first, and both of the case studies I'm going to speak about are um, referenced in this book, which is the second book I'll recommend to you, uh, BIM for Facility Managers, uh, published by the IFMA Foundation a couple of years ago, and John Wiley and Sons and is the best book out there, and one of the only books out there, that speaks about BIM for, for FM. And in that book we had uh, six case studies, so I'll tell you about two of them. Uh, the first is Xavier University in uh, the U.S. Uh, it's a fairly small place, it's got about 7,000 students. Uh, what's notable about Xavier is that a major part of their campus is a, are new buildings, and they made the commitment to put all of their buildings on campus on BIM, something I don't know that anybody else has done to the depth they've done it. A few other campuses have done a, a, a light version of BIM, and I know of a few, um, I think University of South Australia is one of them, that are going through their entire campus. Um, but these folks were, uh, were there about three years ago, so they were leaders of the pack. Um, so uh, they did that. They found uh, some great benefits during the construction, fewer change orders, fewer punch list items. So they got an immediate benefit there. Uh, and they learned some things, and they shared what they learned in the book. So uh, one of the things, uh, their lessons learned included uh, that it's, you should model for design, con construction, and FM. Think about how it's going to be used when you're doing the BIM model. Uh, understand the tools that the contractor and the subs are using. Um, it'll make integration easier if everybody is, is lined up and using similar compatible tools. And provide model and data requirements up front. Um, so the BIM deliverable, so that everybody in clear, plain uh, language knows what they're supposed to do. Uh, the second case study is MathWorks. Uh, MathWorks is a, a software developer of scientific software in the uh, Boston area, and uh, they had a, a unique benefit. Um, when their CEO and founder realized how facilities worked and how um, somewhat backwards the uh, geometric information was, he couldn't believe it and he said surely there's something better and in fact there was, it was BIM. So they had an executive sponsorship from the highest level to put extra effort into using modern tools for designing and managing their new corporate headquarters. Uh, so they got in at the beginning, and uh, when I and they happen to be one of our clients, and when I heard that they were working on the BIM deliverable, I became interested because these were folks who really knew how buildings operated. Um, so rather than coming at it as theorists, they were coming at it as pragmatists. So they worked from the uh, beginning of the process, the uh, design process, and through construction on the properties and attributes that needed to be passed along and finally inherited by the operations and FM group. Um, they learned some good lessons and uh, it wasn't all smooth. Um, they uh, would do a lot of things different. So one of the, uh, the lessons learned are that um, room and asset numbers matter. These are the references that everybody's going to need throughout the process. So taking some care in setting those um, standardizing those and passing those upstream and downstream is, is critical. Uh, getting BIM and data savvy project leads between the um, AEC and owner is key so that everybody knows what they're doing with the BIM. Um, the owner needs to be involved, the facility manager needs to be involved, and the subs need to, 
to be in on this. Most of the information is not going to be created by the general contractor. It's going to be created by the subcontractors or specialty contractors underneath them. Uh, keys to success, create a detailed BIM deliverable guide um, and make BIM uh, an issue, a topic of discussion at the coordination meetings. So I will leave you with uh, two thoughts. Uh, first, we need to do a better job of managing the built environment. It's where people spend most of their lives, it's where most of many of the Earth's resources are used, and we're the stewards of that environment. And if we're going to do that, uh, BIM is one of the essential technologies that we need. So I welcome your questions, um, and Josh, if you want to come on and instruct people how to put in a question, that would be welcome. Absolutely. Yes, um, anyone that has a question, feel free to either put them into the chat box at the bottom or there's also a question on your control panel. There's a question section, feel free and type that in and I will be happy to present them to Michael. We do have some questions ready for you, sir. It says, competitors to your company try to differentiate IWMS and CAFM. What is your opinion on that in your definitions? Um, it depends on uh, which side you're arguing. Uh, technology vendors love to go to battle with acronyms and claim that I've got a true one and you don't. Um, there's a lot of overlap. They uh, both deal with buildings um, and the uh, interface with buildings and occupancy. Uh, we prefer the IWMS label though uh, because it uh, basically speaks to an enterprise level of software. Um, some CAFM systems are, but they didn't start out to be that way. Uh, and speaks to the value of integration, uh, that the true value is when you integrate various corporate systems and various systems within IWMS uh, together. Uh, but in truth, you could use either label and they'd be roughly the same. Great, thanks. Um, this next question, I think it may have been touched upon after this question was asked, but we'll go ahead and ask it just to make sure. Do you have um, information about the stage of excuse me, the stage of worldwide implementation of BIM. What is the percentage of BIM projects and projects using 2D in different countries? I assume that the U.S. has a higher percentage than countries in Europe. Um, don't have a good answer. The best data that I'm aware of are the McGraw-Hill studies, um, particularly the one on construction, which is a couple of years old now, and that shows oh, what the questioner asked. Uh, presumed, which is uh, U.S. more than Europe, um, the, um, with probably Asia following. Uh, but it's a fast-moving change. Um, Europe, UK has a bit of a lead because of the big push of the government. I'd say the continent is probably moving somewhat. The UK and Scandinavia are leaders. Uh, Scandinavia has long been uh, um, pushing this strong. Uh, I would say the continent is a bit slower. Um, and um, most of, of the Americas, the rest of the Americas are a bit slower. Great, thank you. So how do you secure that there is no negative impact with bi-directional interfaces on operation data at the IWMS? Hmm. Um, the, uh, I, I think by understanding it, um, there are there'll be some things where you don't want somebody deleting a, a record of things. Uh, interesting question. Um, we, uh, I think, just by some reasonable t diligence and testing uh, of what could happen, particularly when it comes to, uh, to accidental deletions, that uh, you uh, you have a passing of information but not a, a, a grabbing, if you will. Okay, and then he kind of follows up with that question with who should uh, maintain the BIM in case of bi-directional interface to WIMS? Yeah, let or me uh, address that along with uh, an elaboration to the, the last question. Uh, one of the keys to understanding integration is to uh, understand authoritative source. So depending on what it is, there should be one gold standard or one authoritative source. So for example, walls, um, rooms, etc. The BIM model is the authoritative source. Occupancy, leases, uh, work orders, the facility management system is the authoritative source. And actually occupants, it backs all the way up to HR. So having a, a, a knowledgeable um, 
person, and this is where a good consultant can come in, understand how those interfaces need to work and which system is responsible for, for what is really the key to both safe interchange uh, and um, efficient processes. Uh, so back to this, the second question of who's responsible it is, is for the BIM. Ultimately, the, um, the building owner uh, is the, um, the steward of that BIM model and it's up to the building owner to decide who's going to maintain it. Uh, to, often that uh, is effectively done by contracting out to a BIM specialist. It could be an architectural firm, could be a, a specialized BIM company, or in a few cases it might be expertise in-house. Uh, and then having a clear set of rules of what happens, what should be changed in the BIM model versus the um, facility management system. Great, thank you. It says, if BIM can reduce construction costs by 25%, any idea how much FM costs can be reduced by using BIM? Um, good information in general can save 10% um, or more just on better occupancy, and it's my belief another 20% based on more efficient building operations. Now, is that coming from BIM or CAD? Uh, the difference between BIM and CAD starts picking up, I think, in remodeling, where the BIM uh, system is providing a more accurate, fuller set of information than CAD. Uh, the best, uh, I believe, anybody has as a guess here. Uh, it's a devilishly hard thing to measure, and if you think somebody has, you probably should have a, a little bit of skepticism on how um, precise their information is. Excellent. And they ask, um, can you send us a template for the BIM deliverable guide you mentioned? Uh, yes, well, let's see. The um, um, report to Singapore is available at the web link um, that is on that sheet. Uh, it starts with go.fm systems and goes from there. So if you reference that, uh, you'll find the link. Okay. And uh, again, I say it's not, it, I'm sorry? No, go ahead. Uh, I will say it's not a template for a deliverable guide. Uh, there are some of those around from government agencies. Uh, I've not found any to my satisfaction. Uh, most of them spend pages and pages talking about um, um, sort of the, the why and they hardly get to the what. Uh, so I find them sorely lacking in what you're actually supposed to do. Uh, the best I would recommend is the COBE 2 document available from a Building Smart Alliance. Great. And I just wanted to let everyone know that the um, PowerPoint that he's referencing, going back to it, I will be sending that out tomorrow so everyone will get a copy of that that has registered for this presentation. And then our final question, sir, or getting close to the final question, I think we have two more, maybe three more. FMs um, will have to maintain BIM data after commissioning. What guidance do you know of concerning amounts to budget in order to maintain BIM with valid data? Um, again, the best I might have is a guess, um, but I think it is arguable that it, it falls right into the IWMS or CAFA management uh, or the CAD management. Now, um, and in truth, most organizations have not done a very good job of keeping up with that. Uh, they pay for that when it comes time to remodel the building and um, uh, unnecessary guesswork is kept. So I think it's my belief that there's an offset to the cost of maintaining it to the value down the road to, uh, to keeping it up. Um, obviously, a lot depends on the um, how much the building changes. Uh, if it's a traditional hard wall building, not too much is going to be changing. Uh, also, if you um, keep a fairly lean BIM model, you're not worrying about every little thing, just the major things. Um, but I think probably a truthful answer to that is we don't have enough experience yet as a profession to uh, have a very good idea. Great. Okay, and do you have any benchmarking in relating to direct initiate cost of modeling BIM FM? Um, how about long-term cost unit rate in a measurable manner for industry participants for reference? Um, let's see, let me unpack that question. Uh, was the question how much uh, to model BIM-FM or to maintain it? 
to set it up to init to the initial the direct initial cost. Um, we've got a, a few anecdotal um, references, um, but you know what? I, I'm going to, uh, to I'm going to dodge the question here. Uh, first of all, I don't totally remember the uh, the number, but it's very context specific. Uh, it depends on how much you want. Uh, so it it could be um, uh, is a little, and I'll pardon my. Uh, U.S. units of measurement, but uh, ten cents a square foot to um, to several dollars a square foot, depending on what you're collecting. Uh, so I'll throw out that very broad range and uh, let you do your own conversion to metric. Okay, and we're going to have to move forward because we are at the end of the hour. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Graham. Oh, let me cover this one real quick. Um, just FYI, Montreal, those that are you that will travel to North America, we have Facility Fusion in Montreal coming up, and then the next FMCC webinar, Uncensored, um, I will be sending out information on that in the next couple of days. Uh, next slide, please. And then, as always, the FMCC does like to let everyone be aware of the other councils that are out there as resources for additional information in those specific areas. So at any time, always feel free to reach out to them. And next slide, please. Okay, now I'd like to turn it over to Graham for some closing notes. Thank you, Joshua. And Michael, <clears throat> fantastic um, webinar presentation, a superb topic. Um, getting a lot of um, thanks coming through the, um, the chat lines here. Thank you for being, you know, staying up so late and, and uh, across our time zones and so on. So we're very, very appreciative and, and I look forward to uh, being able to share the link of the recording to everybody else who wasn't able to make it. So thank you very much, Michael. Very welcome. My pleasure. Have a good day, everyone.